Lord, I want to thank you for each person, for each soul, for every human being that's in this place, and uh, even for those, Lord, who are part of our congregation who are not present today, they're traveling, or uh, we also think of our brother um, and elder uh, Cam, who's in the hospital, and Lord, we, we thank you for your very presence in our lives, regardless of whether we're here or not, that you are present with us. And unlike in the time of the Old Testament, where they would have to go to the temple to experience your presence and your Holy Spirit, Lord, you have promised each one of us who has trusted in Jesus that, Lord, your spirit resides within us, and we are grateful. Lord, I ask that you would help us to connect with you today as we look at Psalm 103. As we look at the Psalms, may we connect with you, Lord, and uh, may it be your spirit that leads us and speaks to us. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 You know, just a couple of things. Um, One of the, as I was spending time with the Lord this week and and in going through the book of Mark, and um, it's just, I, I love just going through the, um, going through the Gospels, and I'm, I'm going through the Gospel of Mark, and I'm reading, and there's this one section um, where, I can't remember even the chapter, so forgive me, but this is a scenario where a Sadducee, and these Sadducees, they did not believe in the resurrection, that they wanted to trip Jesus up, and so this scribe or a lawyer came uh, to confront Jesus, and he confronts Jesus with this. He says, Jesus, okay, you believe in the resurrection. Well, then tell me this. There's a woman, Jesus, and she has a husband, and that husband dies. And in fulfillment of the Levi right law, that her brother marries her, and then he dies. And along the line, seven brothers in all marry this woman. So, Jesus, if you believe in the resurrection, can you tell us um, who will be her husband at the resurrection? Which of the seven? And Jesus' response, it was, for me, just like a blow to the forehead. I mean, it just really hit me hard. He says to them, He says to this lawyer, you are wrong because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. And then he explains why he was wrong. But I stopped reading right there. When he said, you know not the scriptures nor the power of God. And this was someone who was trained in the scriptures. But he didn't know them. And as I (laughs) cried out to the Lord and said, forgive me, he made it clear that he wants us, beginning with me, To be a people who know the scriptures, not for information, but for transformation. That our lives would be affected forever based on what's in his word. That we would be a people who know the scriptures. But not just that. That we would be a people who would know the power of God. Think about this. The spirit of God lives within you if you've trusted in him. Are you living? Am I living in the power of the creator of this universe? That's what he's, this challenge is to us. And I, as we study the Psalms, as we look through them, let's not look with our head only, but with our hearts and ask the Lord to help us to know and understand what he's communicating to us, but that we would also also allow his power to flow through us to accomplish his perfect work in our lives. So that's a challenge for us as we study the word in Psalm 103. 
is the psalm that we're going to start with today. It's a psalm that I chose because it's a psalm that I enjoy. And the title of the message today is God is Good. And as we started our worship today, we sang the song 10,000 Reasons, or I think 10,000 Years. I forget the name of the title, forgive me, but it was 10,000. <laughs> but it's Bless the Lord, O My Soul, how we started out that song. And that is how Psalm 103 begins. But before we get into the psalm itself, I want us to understand a little bit about the psalms. Now, the psalms are in the Old Testament, so, and the psalms are a collection of 150 poems or songs. The Hebrew name for the book means praises. So think of this psalm, think of psalms as being the songbook of the Israelites or the Jews, and, and also for us as Christians. And David, King David, authored 73 of the psalms, and AKA means also known as, David was also known as for his, his wonderful work there in, in the psalms by the Holy Spirit's leading. Uh, as the sweet psalmist of Israel. He was a great songwriter. David played the lyre and the harp. He was a, he was a musician, and, and I'm sure that the worship leaders understand that. And not only was he a great musician, but he was a great songwriter. Why? Or, pra or praise this here? Because he knew God. And his writings were sweet. Praises, but also prayers. Psalms are used for prayers and praises to connect with God. And I want to encourage you. It's one of the things that over the last year or so, as I've been um, in this position as pastor, is just times with the Lord, for me, are sweet when I go through the Psalms. And I want to encourage you, if you don't already have a practice of doing that, when you go before the Lord and you're on your own with Him, and maybe you don't know what to pray, or you don't even feel like praying, Open up a psalm and read it and pray it back to God. And ask him to reveal himself to you as you do that. And you'll find that he does. He will reveal himself to you through the psalms. And that's how we connect with God. That's what they're there for, to help us to, um, to not only worship and praise him as we read them and as we look at them, but also there are many times where there's uh, you can... Here, David's soul is he's in anguish over his sin or going through other things in life. And, and we can relate to those things. And so that helps us as, as we pray. So let's keep that in mind as we go through uh, the Psalm 103 this morning. And uh, Psalm 103 begins with, Praise the Lord, my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul. And you can just imagine David talking to himself. And um, I, I don't know if you've ever uh, played sports, but um, if you've ever been in a football locker room before a game, you know, I played in high school, and one of the things that I would do and I would see others doing before we went onto the field is that we would be pumping ourselves up and our friends and teammates up. And we'd just be either talking to ourselves or talking to one another. And I remember as a freshman, I was doing this for the first time on the football team, and one of the other football players, he, we, were, we were just excited. We are holding each other's hands, getting pumped up because we're going to go out and, and hit. We're going to go out and play football. Yeah. And so we were so excited about that. And we're getting excited, and we're just challenging each other. Let's go. Let's go. We can do this. We can do this. Yay. He grabs my helmet, and he goes, bam, and he just hits me as hard as he can with his helmet. He practically knocked me out, and I was like, okay, relax now. I can't even play because I can't see straight, but this is, it, it, you could see David saying, just talking to himself, pumping himself up, and how does he do that? What, what gets his soul praising God? Well, then he continues. And he says, forget, talk, David, David, forget not all his benefits, all the benefits of God. 
and he begins to list them. And if you think about that, you can imagine David being there for eternity because he would never be able to list all the benefits of God. But it, what's wonderful as you see this is he's, he's beginning to list what he has observed, what he personally has experienced, what he's seen. And, and I don't know about you, but when, uh, when, when I meet somebody for the first time, somebody can tell me about them, but it's not until I get to know them and see them actually interact with me and other people that I really get to know them and who they are by watching what they do. Well, here is what he's saying. These are the things that God does, which are benefits to us. And so as we read these things, think about your own life. Think about how these apply to you. And if they don't apply to you, because you don't know God that way yet, well, this, we want to introduce you today to this God that David speaks of and that we here know. And he says, who forgives all your sins, not some, but all, and heals all your diseases. Who redeems your life from the pit. And pit there means the grave. Who redeems your life. Who, who ransom, who buys back your life from the very grave. And not only that, but once he's bought you back and brought you to life, that he crowns you. He puts a crown upon your head and mine with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things. Think about that, your desires. And, and we know that the Word tells us that He grants us the desires of our heart. He puts the desires in us, His desires. And when His desires are there, and when we, we feel those, He says He satisfies those with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. And for many of us here at the home church who've been here a long time, and I've been here since 1982, and five kids and grandchildren, so I'm old. Um, and, but those of us who are old, we look at this and we say, wow, it renews our youth like the eagles. And if you get that picture of an eagle soaring with power, and we think, even at my age, Lord, I, I can do things. I can be adventurous and have youthful energy and hope. Yes. Renews your youth like an eagle. Goes on to say, the Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. As a deputy district attorney, I practiced in Santa Clara County here. And I started out my career as a defense attorney working with my dad and his law firm. And ended up saying, I can't continue there. It just wasn't my calling, and I was a believer at the time, so I went over to the DA's office, and I began to work with law enforcement, began to, victims were my clients, essentially, and began to defend them, and I recall this one uh, rape victim, and she had been brutally, brutally raped, and um, I had to put her on the stand to testify, because this man had to go away forever, and she did not want to testify. And I remember just praying for her and asking the church to pray for her and to pray for me. And as I put her on the stand, and I talked to her before I put her on the stand, she came into me and she looked at me in the face. And she points at me and she says, how dare you? How dare you make me have to relive the worst event in my entire life? How dare you? And I could have gotten upset with her, but I didn't. I remember just looking at her, and tears were in my eyes with hers, and just telling her, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that you have to go through this. And I can imagine, as, as we look at this scripture, the, work, the Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. She was the definition of oppression. She was still suffering under that terrible thing that had been done to her was able to encourage her, to let her know that we had prayed for her. And, that, and then she testified, and he was ultimately convicted. And yesterday at our clinic, I had primarily women who were there who were suffering from oppression of domestic violence or 
things that they had suffered. And there were, it was wonderful to see at our free legal clinic that we do the first Saturday of every month. I had five other Christian men who were lawyers who came, gave away their Saturday to help those who were oppressed. Where does that come from? That comes from the character of God. That who, that's the God that we serve. And David is praising him and saying, you're a God who works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in love. Think about this. This is our God. He is not the God that the world wants to say that he is, an angry God, a vicious God, a bitter God, a God who hates the world for all the evil they've done. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve. How many can say, thank you, God, for that? Thank you for not treating me as my sins deserve. And, and as I look back on my life, and I think about the sins that I've committed over the years that I've been alive. I recognize that this is true. If he treated me as my sins deserved, I would not be here. And I know many of you understand that level of love and forgiveness. It goes on to say, For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is the love for those who fear him. Think about that. How high are the heavens above the earth? There's no end to his love. So great is his love for those who fear him. And there is a challenge here, and that is that we fear God. We, re we revere him. We surrender to him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Think about this. It's not from him. It's from us. Transgressions are your sins. Those sins that you committed, those sins that you might be reminded of, those wrongdoings that you may remember and you regret. He says here, as far as the east is from the west, how far is that? You could never get there, right, to the end of that. But that's the distance that he's taken our sins from us. He, that means he does not see them. They are not there, and we shouldn't either. They're under his blood. And I can imagine David just quoting this and praising God with every benefit that he's remembering. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. And you think about that. He remembers our frailty. He remembers that we were like Adam was made from the dust of the ground that that's who we are and we're frail and we need to be cared for gently and tenderly. You can think of Lindsay with her son Peyton, how tenderly she cares for him and loves him. She knows how fragile he is. Well, that's our Father in heaven. That's how much he loves you and me. And that causes us to praise him when we think about who he is. He remembers that we are dust. The life of mortals is like grass, they flourish like a flower of the field. The wind blows over it, and it is gone, and its place remembers it no more. David's thinking about how his life will be over, and no one will remember him, is what he thinks. But then he says, but, but, I might be finite. My days will end. But, but what? But God from everlasting to everlasting. That's eternity. From everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him and not just with them. And his righteousness, in this context, righteousness means salvation and his salvation with their children's children. How many grandparents do we have here? Grandparents, I mean, we think of that, our children's children. 
And we, we think of them and we pray for them. We don't know what, what their life holds, but God does. And this is a promise. And even those children that we will never know. He's talking about eternity. Love for eternity. That's our God. Again, with those who keep his covenant and remember to obey his precepts. The Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. And then he says, praise the Lord, you his angels, you mighty ones. I mean, I could see David just talking to the angels in heaven. You better be praising him. He's worthy of praise. Gabriel and, and the archangel Michael, you better be praying, praising him, you mighty ones. And they're saying, of course we're praising him. We see him every day. We can't help but praise him. And I can see David just jumping around in his room as he's writing this and praising God because he knows him. And that's what the Psalms are for, is to help us connect with God, to remind us who our God is and who we are as children of God. Praise the Lord, you his angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding, who obey his word. And then finally he ends, praise the Lord, all his heavenly hosts, you his servants who do his will. Praise the Lord, all his works everywhere in his dominion. Praise the Lord, my soul. And that's what we're called to do, is to praise the Lord. And as I was sitting with this scripture and saying, Lord, what do I do with it? I, 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 sure, we can praise you, and I want to praise you, and we've just been through it, and, and that took about 10 minutes. So, you know, we can go through every word. And what is it that you want us to focus on, Lord? What, what, what part of this would you like us to remember about you? Because we can only look at one. And, and I believe that this is what he led me to and, and led us to is where David says, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. And redeem, I looked up that word, and it's the Hebrew word redeem, and it means, it gave us a very clear definition. It means kinsman redeemer. Okay, what does that mean? Kinsman, redeemer. And, um, but it also means to ransom. And think about that, ransom. You see in the movie? Have they talk about we know somebody who's kidnapped is ransomed back from the person that has them in bondage, right? They have to pay something to set free the person who's been kidnapped. Well, here we're going to be focusing on the phrase, kinsman redeemer. And I was asking, Lord, okay, so what does that mean? And he led me, and most of you probably expect this, to the book of Ruth. So that now, as we go through, we're going to study the book of Ruth. And as we look at it, I want you to think of it in terms of the redeemer, the kinsman redeemer, and what it means. Because kinsman redeemer once we understand that, we will understand who Jesus is and what it means to be redeemed. Because we want to understand, he says, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. I mean, I, I, that's somebody that I want to know. Can you redeem me from the grave? Can you save me from the grave? Who are you? And then what happens after you save me? You're going to crown me? Crown me with love and compassion. I want more of that. So what, what is this? What does it look like? The book of Ruth, it's otherwise known as God's redeeming love. And this is a wonderful, wonderful story. In fact, Benjamin Franklin, when he was in France, he, he was part of this literary club. And they would come in and they would write, um, they would write these uh, fiction stories and, and short stories, and they would read them to one another. And when they would, then they would comment on them, and Benjamin Franklin decides that one day he's going to tell them the story of Ruth. And he tells them the story of the book of Ruth. 
And he tells them the whole story. And when he's done, they're weeping and they're clapping. And they're saying, Mr. Franklin, that's a wonderful story. We have to make that known to the world. And he says, you who think so little of the Bible, you don't even know it. That story is in the Bible. It was written by God. And this is a wonderful love story. And I want to encourage you to go back and read it and spend time with it. It's in the Old Testament, and they're really not sure when it was written um, or really even who the physical author was. We know it was the Holy Spirit, but they don't really know, and the commentators are um, not sure uh, about who, when and who actually wrote it. But as we go through it, think about what redemption, redeeming love means as we look at this love story. And, and the two characters that we're going to be looking at are Ruth and Boaz. And Ruth, in this story, is a picture of us, a picture of the church. So think of that. From beginning to end of this chapter, she exemplifies us as a church us individually in Boaz is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. And this is how the story begins. And it says that in the days when judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn, or he moved, uh, to the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malan and Kilian. They were Aphrodites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went from the country of Moab, of Moab and remained there. Or, sorry, they went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. They lived there about ten years, and both Malan and Kilian died, so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. What a great start to a story. <laughs> think about Naomi. Think about Elimelech. They leave Bethlehem, Judah, because there's a famine. And when Naomi leaves, she has two sons, and a husband. She is a blessed woman. She has men. And she leaves and they go into Judah, which was about a 30-mile journey through a mountainous range, through the area, uh, the region there, and very uh, around the Dead Sea. So very rocky and difficult, but they end up in, in, in Moab. And Moab was a, an area, uh, a, new, a different country, and it was, they were not followers of the one true God, of, of Yahweh. They were Moabites. And a Moabite was really from the, they were um, descendants of Lot. And they, they, they lived in this region. And so the family goes, and within a while, Elimelech dies. And these are Ephrathites, or they're from the tribe of Ephraim, um, and from the place of Bethlehem. And so Naomi is now there with her two sons who grow up and marry two women, Orpah and Ruth. And they're married for 10 years. And then both of her sons die. And so she's left in a foreign land with no husband and no sons. And these two women, young women. And so later on, as we continue the story and you read, you you find out that Naomi hears from the people in the fields of Moab that the famine in Judah or Bethlehem is over. So she says, I've got to go back to my people. And she packs up to leave and is heading back on foot to uh, Judah. And her two daughters-in-law decide to go with her. And she tells them to return, stay here. Do not come with me. What do I have for you? She says, I'm old. I can't possibly raise up sons for you to marry. <clears throat> I have nothing to give you. Stay here. And, and there's this 
tenderness where they hug her and they kiss her. And she says, no, stay here. Stay with your people. Go back to your mother and father. Go back to your, to your land and, and your people and I'll be fine. So Orpah decides she's going to stay and you couldn't blame her. But Ruth, Ruth refuses. She holds Naomi and she says this. But Ruth said, do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God my God. Where you die, Naomi, I will die, and there will I be buried. May the Lord do so to me and more. Also, if anything but death parts me from you. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more. Can you imagine? This was a young girl who still had her life ahead of her. Her family, everything she knew was in Moab. But she says, Ruth, she says to Naomi, I'm not leaving you. I'm going with you. And that's whether that was love for her husband, Mela, and she was serving him, or whether it was just love for Naomi, but she did an extraordinary thing. And she went with Naomi. You can imagine the journey. You can imagine they're going back to Bethlehem. And Naomi has been gone for years. She's returning to this town completely broken. She left a full woman, blessed with a husband and two sons. And she's returning. And not even alone. She has a young woman, a Moabite a Moabite that is with her, that she has to care for. Imagine their travel, two women alone, traveling that region and that mountain range and heading back to the Beth Bethlehem. So the story continues, and they arrive in Bethlehem, and it says the, 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 the people gather around Naomi and Ruth, and is this Naomi? Is this Naomi? They're looking at her. She's changed, I'm sure, She's broken. She says, don't call me Naomi, which means my delight. But call me Mara, which means bitterness, because God has been bitter towards me and taken everything away. You can imagine there's Ruth by her side. And so the, they leave her, the city people leave them alone. And they're there during the seasons called the barley harvest, and so they're there at that time. And as we now look at Ruth, we have to understand and remember Ruth is a picture of the church, a picture of us. So we look at Ruth, and Ruth is a cursed woman because she was a Moabite. Moab was the son of Lot by incest. In Deuteronomy 23.3, in the Old Testament, it says, No Ammonite or Moabite may enter the assembly of the Lord, even to the tenth generation. None of them may enter the assembly of the Lord forever. Our sin. All of us were born into sin. We are cursed with Adam's sin, and we have sin. All of us. Like Ruth. This cursed woman who is at Naomi's side with nothing. She's not just cursed, she's crushed. Her husband is dead. Her father-in-law is dead. Her sister-in-law has stayed. She's alone. She's got no ability to support herself or Naomi. She's crushed. And how many of you were crushed? before you came to know Christ. And how many of us know people who are crushed, who are still cursed and are crushed by this world and by circumstances that have rendered their lives hopeless? She was condemned. She was condemned by her circumstances. There was no way that her future had any hope. She's a Moabite. Who's going to marry her? She has nothing. She's with a, a widow who's old and aged. But she had a purpose and she had providence with her as we see as we continue 
the story. What happens is Ruth decides that she's got to help feed Naomi and herself. And she tells her, Naomi, I'm going to go and glean in the fields for barley. And what that meant was that they, she would go into the field where they were harvesting the barley and she would glean from that which was left behind. In Deuteronomy 24, 19, this was the law. This is God, okay? This is our God. He gives this law and it tells us a little bit about him. And the law was, for those who are landowners, when you are harvesting in your field and you overlook a sheaf where the barley is, do not go back to get it. Leave it. Leave it for what? For the foreigner, the fatherless, and the widow. So that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. So the idea was, this was like their welfare system. If you were a foreigner, you had no other way of working, you were a widow or fatherless, you could still go into the fields and find the leftovers and glean and take whatever you could get and take it home and from, you would eat. So Ruth tells Naomi, I'm going to go do that today. And she says, I pray that, that, that I will find favor in the eyes of the reapers, those who are harvesting, and that they won't shoo me away. They won't hurt me, the fact that I'm a, I'm a Moabite and that I'm a young woman, but I have to go. You can imagine she's going, risking a lot as she goes out. So we said that she, there was also, she had a purpose and providence was with her. Because what is wonderful is she goes into the field and she's gleaning and collecting. All of a sudden, the owner of the field comes. And he comes, he's this older man, and he comes, he's talking to the laborers, and he sees Ruth. She must have been beautiful, because he immediately asks about her, who is that young woman? And then they tell her, she has been here all day, she's been gleaning. And he calls her over, and he, Boaz, this is Boaz, and he talks to her. And he asks about her, and then she tells him that why she is there, and this is what Boaz says. He's, Boaz um, tells her that he's a relative of hers, that he's a kin of Elimelech. And that he, this is his land, and he tells her, and he's, he says, you, Ruth, we've all heard about the good that you have done for Naomi, and how you've stayed with her and loved her and cared for her. We've all heard that. So we're going to, um, I want you to feel free to glean in this field. So glean what you would. And he tells the reapers, you make sure and leave her a little bit to glean from. And then he tells her, you can stay and have something to drink and be with the women who are working here. Don't, don't worry. Just take what you need. And, and Ruth says to him, how, why, what have I done that you would be so good to me? What, what have I done? He says, all that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me. And how you let your father and mother and your native, left your father and mother in your native land and came to people that you did not know before. The Lord repay you for what you have done. And a full reward be given to you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. So she was there at the end of the day. He fed her and she took food home to her mother-in-law, Naomi. She, he actually gave her a lot of extra barley. And she goes home with this food and she shows it in chapter 3 to Naomi. And Naomi says, well, whose field were you in today? And that's why this is providence because remember, Ruth goes out looking for a field to glean and not knowing whose field she would end up in. She happens to end up in Boaz's field. There's an older wealthy man and happens to be a relative. And Naomi knows that. And so Naomi encourages her. And Naomi tells her, do you know, Ruth, Boaz is a kinsman redeemer. And that's where we get the definition of the word redeem. He's a kinsman redeemer. And what that means is that in the 
Levitical law, in Leviticus 25, 25, if your brother becomes poor and sells part of his property, then his nearest redeemer shall come and redeem what his brother has sold. What it was was a, a law that says that so that land would remain in the family if a man died, that another man who was a kin could buy back property that had been sold outside of the family in order to bring it back into the family so that it would remain part of the family. But that law also included Deuteronomy 25.5, which says, if brothers dwell together and one of them dies and has no son, the wife of the dead man shall not be married outside the family to a stranger. Her husband's brother shall go into her and take her as his wife and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. So this is what a kinsman redeemer would do. Is the husband has died, the widow is left, there is no heir. And what was Naomi's situation? Her husband had died. Well, she had sons, but they died. She had no hope of being redeemed. And now she's old. She can't bear children. So redemption through her by a kinsman redeemer like Boaz was impossible. But Naomi looks at Ruth, and she says to her, Ruth, it's time that I take care of you. It's time that you be taken care of for your future. Boaz is a kinsman redeemer. Ruth knew what that meant. She says, tonight, tonight, Ruth, I want you to dress in your finest clothes. Take a bath. Put some perfume on. Look your best. And then she tells him, she tells her, and I want you to go to the threshing floor. The threshing floor was a place, a big barn like in the city, there at the edge of town, where they, the farmers would come and thresh together. And she says, Boaz is threshing in the threshing floor tonight. He's winnowing in the threshing floor tonight. So go there. Go there and watch. And after he's eaten and had something to drink, and he's going to lay down next to the barley there, you watch for where he lays down. And don't forget where he lays down because there are other men who are going to be laying there. So she has to pay attention and get the right one, right? So don't mess up, Ruth. And when he lies down and he's happy and now he's asleep, you go and lay at his feet. You lay at his feet and then cover his feet. And that's, the, that's all she said. And Ruth says, as you say, I will do. She goes, you can imagine her hiding there, looking and watching and seeing Boaz, eventually making sure she doesn't miss who he is or where he's laying down. He lays down, and she goes and lays at his feet. She uncovers his feet, and she lays at his feet. I want you to think about that. Think about how she's humbling herself, laying at his feet. Think about Jesus. Think about Boaz as Jesus, as a kinsman redeemer. He's calling us to come to his feet, to humble ourselves, to say, I need you, Jesus. Are we willing, if you've never done it, are you willing to humble yourself like Ruth did and go to the feet of Jesus and say, I need you to redeem me because I have no hope without you. So Boaz is sleeping and he wakes up. And he, oh, he wakes up in a startle. And who's that? Who's there? It's dark. Who's there? And Ruth says, it's me. It's your servant, Ruth. And Boaz has a decision to make. What do I do? Do I announce to everybody? I can't. Because she's not supposed to be here. So he says, what, what, what do you want? And she says, you are a kinsman redeemer. And I would, I would ask that you would take your cloak as a wing, she says, I, the words you hear, but she describes it as his wing, the wing of his cloak, and cover her with it. Remember what Boaz had said. He said earlier, the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. And now she's saying, cover me with your wings. Be my kinsman redeemer. This is an older man. He says to her, Ruth, you can have anybody. Why would you want me? 
But he says, but I bless you that you have come for that purpose. And I will redeem you. But there is, he says, there's one problem. What's the problem? The problem is that there's another kinsman redeemer that's nearer to Elimelech than me. And he has to be given first choice. And he says, now leave before the light comes out so that they won't see you here and take this food to Naomi and tomorrow. I will go to that kinsman redeemer and see what will happen. And we know the story, what happens. Boaz goes to the center of the city the next day. He goes to the gates where they have like their outside courthouse. And he calls that kinsman redeemer, the other relative, and sits there among the elders and says, you are a kinsman redeemer for Naomi. Naomi is selling her land. Will you buy the land? And, he, and the kinsman redeemers, the other one, the, the relative says, yes, I will. But then Boaz says, but wait a minute. If you're going to do that, then you also have to take Ruth as your wife. And he refused that. He said, well, I can't do that because that will jeopardize my inheritance because I'm sure he had sons. And, and sure enough, another son born to, to Naomi through Ruth would then inherit over his children. And so he's looking out for himself and says, no, I won't redeem Naomi then. You can. So Boaz and Ruth get married. And the story is not over. They get married. He redeems her. And what is so special is that Naomi had no way of being redeemed except for Ruth, through Ruth. Ruth decides she's going to have Naomi redeemed through her with Boaz. And it seems that she's a younger woman sacrificing herself for the benefit of her mother-in-law. But the word tells us here at the end of chapter 4 that the woman's, the, that Ruth has a son. And then the women say to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a redeemer. And may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became his nurse. And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed, O-B-E-D. Obed is the father of Jesse, who is the father of King David, from whom Jesus came. That line. Ruth's sacrifice will never be forgotten. Boaz's redemption of Naomi and Ruth will never be forgotten. Everlasting love, righteousness to children's children. This is forever. And that's when we come to the kinsman redeemer. When we are redeemed through Jesus Christ, it is forever. You will never, ever be forgotten or never, never what one of your good works done in the name of Jesus for the sake of somebody else. Ever be forgotten. God will remember it forever and bless you. Who redeems your life from the pit and crowns your, you with love and compassion. That's what he did. Through, that's what he did in Ruth. And that's a picture of redemption that we celebrate today as we celebrate God's redeeming love. Let's pray. I'm going to ask the worship team to come and we're going to continue just worshiping him. And Lord, we thank you for your redeeming love. We thank you for the picture of Boaz who doesn't look at Ruth and her cursedness being a Moabite, but loves her and redeems her and Naomi and, and their future generations. Well, that's what you promised to those of us who would fear you and give our lives to you through your son, Jesus Christ, our kinsman, redeemer. We pray, Lord, I pray 
And I'm going to ask, if you're somebody here who does not know God in that way, I don't care how young you are or how old you are. This is an opportunity where the Spirit of God is present and He's speaking to you now. There is an opportunity for you to be redeemed. Without redemption, Jesus said, unless you believe in him, you will not be saved. God sent Jesus as his rescuer for you and me. If you reject him, there will be no other. This is an opportunity right now that may not come again. We don't know what tomorrow holds. I want to encourage you. Cry out to Jesus, your kinsman redeemer, and just say, sit at his feet, go to his feet. Let him know that you need to be redeemed, that you were lost. And he, I promise you, will redeem you right now, forever. You, your children's children. Lord, I pray that you would help uh, anyone who is struggling right now with that to surrender to you to pray Lord for forgiveness for their sins to ask you to redeem and cleanse and to Lord save them today forever would you do that in their hearts in our hearts Lord for those of us who have already been redeemed and we know it may we celebrate your redemptive love in Jesus name amen